Hi, welcome back to Hell. It seems we're back for Revelation Round 2 with a fun new challenge. You see, a few months back I watched a fun video by Seer on beating Pokemon without the letters E and A. I remembered it after posting my last video and thought, hey, that could be pretty interesting if adapted into Fire Emblem. Because, really, the name of my game isn't necessarily being good at Fire Emblem, but rather doing weird theory crafting, usually that which comes from arbitrary restrictions. So, for this challenge, my arbitrary restriction is a ban on the letter A. However, the question is how I enforce this ban on the letter A. Well, here are my rules. 1. If a character's name has an A in it, I cannot use them. 2. If a character's current class has an A in it, they cannot be used to fight. Viable characters whose classes have an A can still act as dual support where their classes won't really matter. And 3. Weapons and items with the letter A in them cannot be used. So, with these rules set in place, can you beat Fire Emblem Revelation without the letter A? Uh, no. Obviously not. Uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves, though, so I'll start from the beginning. As I create my Corrin, there are two major decisions that are made here. The first is once again their gender, having to play as male Corrin for this specific run. Once I've made a suitable Corrin in my likeness, I then make my second important decision, making my talent mercenary. Now wait a second, Moss! Mercenary has an A in it! That's a banned class, I hear you saying, and yes, it is. However, this is something that will come into play later down the line, so keep it filed away in your mind. As we're thrown into the prologue, I can show off the rules in action here. With the name Moss and the class of Nor Prince equipped with Bronze Sword, Corrin is 100% usable in the scenario, so I'm free to attack the enemy. However, Takumi is an archer. With both his name and class containing A's, he is sent away, unable to participate in combat. With these rules in place, the prologue and chapter 1 are completely doable. However, our ability to follow this rule set is broken the moment chapter 2 starts. See, no matter what version of Corrin I choose, either Jacob or Felicia joins in this battle. However, both of their names have A, so they are banned units. Gunter, while in possession of a valid name, is in a banned class as a Great Knight, not to mention having an Iron Lance equipped. And as for Corrin, our character who had been following the rules the past two maps, well, now they've been forcibly equipped with Ganglari, a weapon with multiple A's in it. No matter how you look at it, no amount of skill can get around the fact that none of my units should be allowed to fight on this map. As such, I will keep count of the number of impossible chapters in this run, at least as far as our rules are concerned. So for now, we have one impossible chapter. Still, since Korn and Gunter should both be valid units in the future after I have more control over customization, I will use the two of them as my fighters here. As a tutorial map, there is little issue from here. Chapter 3 is our second impossible map, for the exact same reasons. So again, I play this map mostly as I would casually, just not using Felicia as she will never be usable in the future. As for chapter 4, I can technically get around this issue if I allow Ryoma to clear the entire map as he isn't constrained by the same rules. However, he is still someone with an A in their name, so relying on him to handle everything feels a bit cheap. So, no, this map is also technically impossible, if you ask me. I also had some of the worst luck with RNG I've ever run into with the start of this file. My level ups thus far had been pretty poor, and for the first time in my life, I actually saw Hinoka and Sakura die on this map. Chapter 5 is also impossible, as everyone has an A in their names, and Corrin's class is now Feral Dragon. So, uh, yeah. We'll just have to do the standard fare for a casual playthrough here, I think. Though, funnily enough, I've actually forgotten how to play this map casually and messed that up, 
So I sort of fell back on my Corrin Azura strategy. Please don't judge me, I'm only used to playing randos of this game at this point. I rarely play Fates casually in any sense of the word, okay? So, now that we're done with the tutorial maps and have reached the Branch of Fate, we'll obviously be set free and the run will be completely valid from here, right? I mean, we no longer have Ganglari, and now we have two weapons after all. No! Fuck you! <laughs> This is a revelation, idiot! <laughs> Zur and Felicia are my only other units, and Corrin's weapons are the Yato and a Dragonstone, both of which clearly have a letter A in them. So, chapter 6, at least in Revelation, is completely impossible in this run. And while it might be possible in certain other routes, uh, I chose Revelation for the No Way Challenge for a very specific reason. Were I doing Birthright or God forbid Conquest, I very much would have banned a different letter. As I have no viable units here, I just play the map casually while killing off Felicia. Because as far as I'm concerned, if a character is completely unusable in my run, they may as well be dead. With the map cleared, we officially have five whole impossible maps for this run. But to be kind, let's say that the run truly starts from Chapter 7 onwards, kind of like a solo unit run might do. After all, we had no control over these first few chapters. So we enter the Astral Plane, and this is where the first vital decision happens. I can use my Dragon Vein points to purchase one building, and it has to be the Dusk Armory. If any other building is chosen, the run is essentially softlocked. The reason is, I need a new weapon. While I could build the Dawn Armory, this is an extremely poor choice, as the only weapons I can buy for corn are swords and katanas. And sadly, the Dawn Armory sells katanas, which you know, have the letter A in them. The Dusk Armory, on the other hand, sells swords. Steel, iron, bronze, all these swords are allowed as none of them have A in the name. This is why it had to be the Dusk Armory, otherwise my sole unit would have no weapons. Luckily, after buying myself some swords, there was a challenge map available. This is important less for the experience and more for gaining another point for building my castle. I use this one to build a stave shop, though the rod shop would have been just as good in this case. The reason I do so is to have access to buying some concoctions, the only healing item I can use at the moment. After all, Vulnerary has an A in the name. Has it kicked in yet that I'll be saying that a lot? It should, as A is the third most commonly used letter in the English language. <laughs> Wahoo! Another thing of importance here are the tonics, though. These will be important for now, as I have a uh, one unit. If I want corn to survive, I'll need every boon I can get. Thankfully, all tonics are usable except for the magic and resistance tonics, so I buy a few to make sure that the next major battle goes smoothly. After once again deciding that yes, following Azura off a cliff is a good idea, I pump corn full of tonics. This is important as trying this without any improvement to HP or defense will lead me to dying pretty quickly if I'm not careful. If anything, this is a good way to assure a nice safety net. Thankfully, each area I open has at least one fourth enemies come from, so once they're cleared away, I can huddle down and heal up before pressing forward, and once I reach far enough into the cave, I meet our good friend Gunter. Now, as he is, I can't use him to fight. Once again, he is a great knight with a lance equipped, so I remove his equipment and have him pair up with Corrin. As stated in my rules, this is the one way I'm allowed to use viable characters who are currently stuck in a banned class. With his help, I'm easily able to clear the boss without issue. I brought along a bronze sword to prevent any chance of crits from the boss, but apparently it ended up being unnecessary this time around. Once I return to home base, I reclass Gunter into a wyvern lord so he can finally be usable. But wait! 
you might say. Doesn't reclassing a unit require the use of a seal? Heart seals, master seals, all of them have an A in them. So surely they're banned. Well, O oh astute viewer, you are wrong. Don't you see the names of these things? There are no A's. Uh, but, uh, yeah, seals should be banned by these rules, so what gives? Well, I don't hate myself enough to lock myself that much. So my third and final rule, it actually had a secret exception that I hadn't shared. The use of seals is entirely legal. Now, if you truly despise yourself, you could go ahead and try this run without the use of seals. Prove to me that I suck at the game or something, but I'm more interested in how I'll be limited in my use of units and classes, not completely tortured. And that's what this run was really about. So yes, this is the main reason why I've said this run is impossible, because, spoilers, if I can't use seals, I'll be stuck to only four units who are in their base classes. I'm not doing that. Still, let's continue on with the challenge and enter Moses' paralogue. With one powerful Korin and a Gunter supporting them, it's pretty easy making our way to Mozu. She'll be our third unit, but right now she's trapped in the villager class, so I tuck her away into my pocket. Thanks to guarding Korn in battle, she'll slowly gain experience and eventually we'll be able to do something with her, but for now she's relegated to guard duty. With this party of three, we now head towards Fort Jinya. Now, while Gunter may be our Yagen in this game, he will die when sneezed on. So battle is really just up to Corrin with some help from Gunter. And while I do have concoctions for healing, I choose to take this map slow. My healing items are limited, so I refrain from using them in favor of making use of the healing tiles here. It's times like this that make me miss Azura's personal skill. Still, this map was mostly fine. The only issue was Yukimura though he was fine so long as I remained careful about damage. So, alright, this hasn't been so bad thus far. I mean, it sucks that we don't have Azura, but we've handled things easily enough. But now it's time for Chapter 9. In this household, we hate Revelation Chapter 9. With so many ninja and heavy hitters around, this map is a slog. And unlike last time, I don't get free healing from Azura. So I have to work through this using my limited supply of concoctions. Luckily, Gunter levels up pretty early on in the map, learning Rally Defense. This is a great help in Korn's survivability, as well as helpful in slowing our use of concoctions. Nothing interesting really happens here, but the map does take nearly an hour to complete. I did open two of the chests, this time being the money and physic, because this time around I can't make use of the dual katana. And just like last challenge, I thankfully got a crit on Fuga, ending the slog of a chapter. Up next, Fog of War. Or, I guess, Ice of War? I'm still basically only at two units for now, and I can really feel it in this map. Without Azura here to help, this map takes longer than strictly necessary. Not to mention my low-res team is a problem when it comes to the mages at the end of the map. Because of this, I choose to pump Corrin and Gunter full of tonics and rush towards the boss. By using a throwing club, Gunter was able to take out the two mages near Zola along with the mercenary. And from there, we carefully uncovered the mages hidden in the ice just outside Zola's enclave. Luckily, by picking out the Mjolnir mage on his own, I was able to make this section extremely safe. From there, Zola was taken down, and then the rest of the map was cleared for free items. While a good portion of these items would be completely unusable as per the rules, I could still sell them for gold so as to buy proper equipment for my army. As for my reward for completing this chapter, I gain Obro as another viable unit for my party. However, all of her classes contain the letter A. This means that she'll have to up her supports with another character in order to gain access to a viable class. And that's exactly what my secondary class was for. I took a moment to grind supports with Obro until we eventually reached S support. 
From there, she was able to promote and change to a hero due to my mercenary talent, which nets me three usable units in terms of fighting. With our new addition, we now head into Mokushu. It's here that we find our next unit, Orochi. Luckily, as a diviner, she'll be usable from the get-go, though it's pretty easy for her to die here. As such, we end up huddling in a small area with Korin guarding the only way in. Doing so clears all the units who move in on their own, allowing for easier traversal of the map. Once Korin reaches level 20, I change them to a Hoshido Noble, though I can't exactly use any sort of healing staves, as the only usable healing items at my proficiency are Bloom Festals and Heals, and as always, they have the letter A in them, so it's a no-go. The uh, rest of the map is easy enough to deal with, though I start to run into another issue. That being I'm running low on my supply of concoctions. Since they're in limited supply at the moment, I need to make them last until I can upgrade the staff or rod shop to buy more. Because of this new chokehold on me, I choose to rush through chapter 12. I ignored extra enemies as I fought my way over to Flora, thankfully being able to do enough damage with my limited units before enemy phase had the chance to destroy me. As for chapter 13, I broadened all my units to safely make it out into the main map before blocking them in a safe location. From there, I was able to send Korn off with Gunter to the location of the Valite soldiers. I chose to clear the enemies around me for some extra safety, but I was really here because this is a defeat the boss chapter. Once I felt safe enough to move forward, I took down the boss with little issue. Thankfully, for completing this map, I unlocked the ability to upgrade the staff and rod shops, and with this upgrade, there's now unlimited stock of concoctions. So now I'll have infinite access to healing items now, so long as I still have money in my pockets. I chose to take this moment to handle Orochi's weapons, as well as clearing out the challenges in order to gain levels on her. This also had the benefit of providing me with more money so I can buy more concoctions. With everything now in order, we head to Port Dia, where we meet Elise. Luckily for her, she is allowed within the rules of this challenge run, so she gets to live another day. However, she cannot be kept in the Trobador class, and both her potential advanced classes have A's in the name. Now, while her secondary class is being a wyvern rider, which is allowed, the change simply cannot be done. Due to the rules of this run, there are no usable E-rank clubs, meaning Elise would have no way of attacking. And as I can't use arm scrolls, I have no viable way of upping her proficiency. However, because of the DLC, I have the ability to choose between getting a free witch or ballistician. The obvious choice is, of course, picking up the witch class, and Elise is the one who gets to become a witch, making her immediately usable on this map. We also get Effie here, whose name and class are both technically viable. However, knights aren't exactly all that useful around here. The big issue is that they can only use lances, and the only two lances I have access to are brooms and sticks. These are not good weapons. Not to mention, both advanced classes for knights have A's in them! Yay! Not to worry, though, as I have a solution that will come into play in the future. For now, we just need to fight our way through this map. In this case, I choose to handle the right side of the map first. The reason I do so is because of Benny, a third viable unit we get in this chapter. Just like Effie, Benny is a knight, though he comes at a higher level. Once Elise talks to him, we've now essentially doubled the size of our army. However, Benny and Effie are essentially dead weight at the moment. While they might normally be neat knights to have, they can't use any practical weapons. Not to mention they don't really have higher defense than Corrin at the moment. Still, I have plans to fix these issues soon enough. For now, we just focus on clearing the chapter, which goes by slowly, but gets handled easily enough once all the paladins are gone. With Effie and Benny now obtained, I can actually get to work on my plans, with Effie being the key to fixing my army. I needed her to reach S rank with Benny, and Mozu to reach A plus with Effie. By doing so, I'm able to grind Mozu to level 20 with the knight class before making her a sniper. 
As for my fun little knights, Benny has fighter as his secondary class. Because he and Effie share the same base class, Effie gets the fighter class from S supporting Benny. This allows me to turn both of them into heroes. While it would be nice to have a berserker, I sadly have no way to gain club experience and thus cannot use a club only unit. With my army prepared, it's time to meet the Rainbow Sage. Unlike with my last run, we actually get to recruit Nyx here. However, we can't use her immediately as she is Dark Mage, so into the pocket realm she goes. As for the map, it isn't too hard, so long as you don't make stupid mistakes. And while I do have more units than my last run, we've run into the problem of all my units being a lot weaker in this one. Still, I've been using Tonics and Gunter's Rally Defense to help remedy that. Once we've seized the throne, we get to meet the Rainbow Sage. He clearly did not get the memo as he upgrades the Yato to the Alpha Yato. Not only does this not remove the issue of our sacred weapon having A's in it, uh, but it makes it much worse. For doing so, he is killed by the plot. Now we move on to the chapter gauntlet with our okay team. It's pretty manageable so long as I keep my party close together. Thankfully, the royal entourage keeps a bunch of the enemies busy trying to kill them while I make my way towards Hans. Once Thumbface is defeated, we move towards the bottomless canyon proper. Unlike last chapter, I actually want quite a few of the units here. First is Leo, who can thankfully be reclassed to a sorcerer so I can make use of him immediately. Up next are Niles, Odin, and Perry. I can't make use of Perry yet, but Niles and Odin can be promoted to a bow knight and sorcerer. With these additions, we officially built our entire army. Well, almost. There is an optional character we'll want to pick up, but first we need to complete this chapter. It's honestly not too bad, so long as I'm careful. And with the number of magic users I have, it's pretty easy to handle the knights covering the left side of the map. That does not mean I will rescind my disdain of mages in this game. I still don't like using them. Plus, there's still the issue of Iago. This time around, most of my units have piss-poor resistance, so handling Iago is a dangerous endeavor. That doesn't mean it's impossible, though, as Leo, Elise, and Orochi are all fairly good at tanking magic. With Iago chipped down, Obro can easily come in with a finishing blow. And now, after watching a homoerotic handshake between two dead guys, we can finally take a break from the story, because guess what time it is? It's baby war time, which means now I have to spend god knows how long grinding experience and supports to fix my army and obtain children. First, I make sure to get next to A-plus support with Orochi so that I can have her level grind as a diviner. Next, I have two important S supports to reach. I have Nyx as support Leo, as she's one of the few people available to marry him. I, it didn't really matter who married Leo, but Nyx was the most practical. Not that there were many options available. The other important support is between Perry and Niles. Perry does have access to the sorcerer class on her own, however it's not exactly a good option for her. Because of this, I need her to reach as support with Niles so she can reclass to Bow Knight. Now that my army's ready, it's time to collect children, or really just one child, that being Forest. Now, you might say that there are other child units I could use like Shiro, and that's half true. Yes, Shiro would be a valid option, but I can't obtain him without making use of Ryoma in some way. Of course, if I wanted to destroy my already fragile mental state, I could grind for lucky Ryoma supports in my castle. That would technically still work within my rules, however, I am extremely committed to my stupidity and have maybe sort of killed off everyone who has an A in their name. So characters like Ryoma and Azura don't even exist. So no, I will not be inflicting psychic damage upon myself in hopes of gaining a few more units. As for obtaining Forest, his paralogue is simple enough. It's a route the enemy map, though. The enemies won't move until you enter their attack range. Not to mention that once you've started combat, a fighter will run full speed towards Forest to kill him. Still, so long as I played carefully, saving Forest is completely possible. It 
did take me a few tries. I don't normally play child paralogues, so I don't usually know what to do. But I managed my way and saved the day. With Forrest now in our army, we finally have a healer. While Orochi and Korn technically have the ability to use staves, the only one available for them at the moment is rescue, which isn't exactly a great option for grinding staff proficiency. Forrest, on the other hand, joins us at level 20 with C-level staff proficiency. Thankfully, being a male unit means he can reclass to being a butler and not a maid. Were he the maid class, I would be unable to use him as a healer. And now that my army is complete, it's finally time to finish the rest of the game. As we enter our first Vel map proper, we must watch Scarlet die again. This map acts as a great introduction to why you want flying units in this path if the Frozen Sea chapter wasn't enough proof for you. I only have one flying unit though, so it's more a game of playing the intended way. Also, we now have more units than deployment slots, which is wild. I choose to bench Niles and Odin because uh, they're not great. And since the units I do use have varying degrees of usability, I choose to tackle this map as one big group. This means warping all my units to the bottom right corner of the map, as this area has the most space for maneuverability without putting all my units directly in danger. From here, it's a matter of carefully clearing out the map from right to left while using all the dragon mains in order to access the commander's location. I slowly became more confident with the units I've obtained while going through this map, making it easier and easier as I moved along. This eventually culminated in my confidence in tackling the boss, easily clearing out her box before letting Elise nuke her. Up next, the escape map. Unlike last time, I don't have a completely cracked Kana to carry me across the map, so I choose a slightly safer approach. I take my most elite units along with Gunter and Forrest for some healing and rally defense. With this setup, I was easily able to clear a path through the Berserkers and cavalry to the escape route. For completing this chapter, we befriend a child who promises to help us defeat Anankos. Pinky promise. You can definitely trust me. It's not like my name is Anthony. You know, a name that starts with the forbidden letter. <laughs> Please don't kill me. I'm just an innocent little baby. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, he definitely didn't try to get us killed on a bridge and thrust us into another fight. One which I simply chose to focus on getting to the boss of. After all, all the chests around here have useless items for me. I'm not putting myself in danger just to sell useless items. It's basically here that I embrace my main strategy going forward. While Benny and Effie don't have the greatest speed, they have massive levels of defense and pretty good strength. This makes them invaluable walls to block enemies, and with a rally from Gunter, I then set them up to cover a choke point and let enemies get themselves stuck on the duo. From here, they'd survive a round of enemy phase, having baited the enemies closer to my army. From here, my mages and Mozu would be able to pick off the enemy from safety, while Forrest could heal up Benny and Effie. Rinse and repeat. Of course, when enemy mages enter the mix, things have to change a bit. Though it's just a simple switch where Elise and Leo will bait the mages, and if those mages can't kill themselves on the siblings, my other units will swoop in to finish the job. This strategy is greatly helpful in getting past this chapter, though there was a small moment where I panicked with the Malignites, but the whole situation sorted itself out pretty well. Once we made our way to the boss, completing the chapter was a cakewalk, as Kinshi Knights are weak to Mozu. Mozu is our lord and savior. Be sure to regularly pay your respects to her, or she will kill you. Please, I haven't seen my daughter in weeks, you Ah oh, shit, that Anthony kid betrayed us? Who could have possibly seen this coming? At least he's cool enough to give us my favorite map to ever exist. Whatever the case is, I use the same strata as I did last chapter. Benny and Effie lure physical units, Leo and Elise lure magic units. 
I don't salute the place because I can. It's pretty easy when such a map is so memorable that the enemy movements are almost ingrained in your brain. Anthony goes down without a hitch, and then we move on to Arete's chapter. Unlike with my last run, I actually get through this chapter pretty quickly. This time, I chose to simply go along the upper path on the map and push my way forward to Arete. This essentially nips the issue of the early movers in the bud while making quick progress towards the commander. As for Arete, say hi to Mozu! Chapter 23 is one I had a bit of difficulty with initially. After my last challenge run, I wanted to keep pair-ups for movement purposes to a minimum, as immediately having access to dual attacks has much better value. But I kept making small mistakes that really, really left me kind of angry with myself. That's when it hit me. Temporarily turn Mozu into a Kinchi Knight. The platforms that move back and forth on this map are open, unlike Sumer Agi's map, meaning I can freely position a flyer to do some baiting. Gunter can't do this as his stats suck ass, but Mozu. Mozu is powerful. So, how'd my plan go? Well, I started off by waiting on the starting island as I knew that the Kinshi Knight and Scarlet would make a beeline to my army. Since the enemy didn't know how to use the platforms, that meant holding back was the safest play. Once the two flyers were in range, I quickly brought them down before sending Benny, Effie, Obero, and Corrin onto the platform. While it may seem a bit stupid to send off only physical units when the enemies on the next island over are all physical fighters, it all has a purpose. See, Gunter is in range to rally defense for my team, while Mozu quickly takes out the enemy with a sword catcher from afar. Up next, my physical fighters can pull out to take down the nearby archer together. From there, the Spearmaster can hurt himself on Effie. On the next turn, Perry can dual support Gunter as I put him in a precise position to do so last turn. Elise is able to warp next to my physical fighters in order to help take out the Spearmaster. The remaining units can get on the platform to join the army, and my physical fighters can start cutting a path forward. As I kept moving forward, I used Mozu to pick off enemies on other islands and add Gunter, Fairy, Perry around to unlock chests. And when I had Mozu lure the one major enemy that gave me the idea to temporarily make her a Kinchi Knight, I suddenly had a new idea. See, Mozu was not in a support formation, which meant that whoever attacked her would be able to get away with a dual attack. In this situation, Mozu was situated on the opposite side of a moving platform, in a spot where the nearby Onmyoji could attack her. But the nearby Swordmasters couldn't. But those Swordmasters could assist with dual attacks. This meant that one Swordmaster walked onto the platform with the Onmyoji. While our magical friend got killed on Mozu, the Swordmaster had ended his turn on this moving platform meaning he was ferried to the main island after enemy phase was over and would have proper pathing towards my army on his next enemy phase. With a tactic like this, I could lure enemies onto platforms that they would otherwise never touch in order to ferry them back to my army in a safe and controlled environment. This would greatly reduce the risk of running face first into enemy territory where they could eviscerate me if I didn't plan out my sent team just right. So, I chose to try out the strategy on the enemies situated in the upper right corner of the map. Thankfully, there was an Onmyoji situated right by where the platform would stop, making the perfect lure for Mozu. I set her in range of the Onmyoji, and they took the bait. They managed to rope in a master of arms to assist, and afterwards a master ninja walked onto the platform as their pathing would eventually allow them to reach Mozu in this state. However, the ninja did not plan for the platform to move away, and my team managed to take down the, these two captured units. From here it was much safer to ride the platform over the next island, and progress from here was smooth. As for Arede, she once again got to meet Mozu. 
Up next, the sneaking mission. And this time I have two units with lock touch, so I actually snuck through the place. Thankfully, as Bow Knights, Perry, and Niles have a lot of movement, making it easier for them to dodge the guards. Elise is also here, but she can keep up thanks to, uh, being a witch. While I sneak my way through the place, I make sure to open each of the chests. The items might be useful, and even those that I can't make use of can be sold for a decent bit of gold. Once I finally made it to the third blue door, using totally legitimate means and definitely not making use of save states to preserve my dwindling sanity, I had a new obstacle in place. Makoto and her ads. After a good bit of testing, I eventually found a decent strategy for this roadblock, despite having two shit units, one half decent unit, and Elise. Once the door was unlocked, I would immediately retreat from enemy range and have Korn use rescue to pull Niles along. I cannot believe I finally got to make use of the Hoshido Noble class for its intended purpose in this run. Oh my god. <laughs> Anyways, with this decent position, I now set Elise up to lure the, and eliminate the Oni Chieftain and Niles to handle the nearby guard. It's fine now, by the way, to alert the nearby ninja. They can't set off the alarm anymore. With the ninja gone, I won't have to worry about them messing with my movement. And with the Oni Chieftain gone, the path to Mikoto will no longer be blocked. However, she had reinforcements who were approaching me, so I had to pull back into a favorable position. Making use of dual attacks, Elise could help parry and Niles damage the merchant before she moved to eliminate the Master of Arms. Korn could then move forward to finish off the merchant, giving me safe movement towards Makoto. Luckily, the Master Ninja and Great Master won't move unless aggroed or if there's someone they can heal. This allows me to place my units just outside of their range to set up my attack I'd been planning from the start. Because Nylons and Parries are outlaw versions of Bow Knights, this means they have the Movement Plus One skill, which helps in the completion of this strategy. While my original plan was to send in Parry or Niles near Makoto so Elise can warp in and take her down, I chose a, to make a safety modification to this strategy. Corrin paired up with Niles so he could ferry the Lord over to Makoto, allowing our little dragon to deal a good chunk of damage with their silver sword. This was just to make sure Elise could warp in and kill Makoto without having to worry about dying to a counterattack, but it seems I had little to worry about as even if Makoto could hit Elise, she wouldn't do enough damage to kill. Still. It was a nice victory, and I am once again made to face Makoto's parting revelation. The, this time I had a different thought, which is, why doesn't anyone assume that Makoto being a Valet Royal means that the Hoshiden kids could be Valet Royals too? I mean, obviously those of us who know the lore would know none of the Hoshiden siblings have blood ties to the Valet Royal bloodline. And while Ryoma and Hinoka mention that they know they aren't related to Makoto and their S supports, that doesn't mean that others wouldn't make such an assumption. Like, come on, it was a whole big secret that was kept about how Korin is unrelated to the Hoshidans. Takumi and Sakura didn't know. Did they believe Korin a half-sibling, knowing that they had a different biological mother being the previous queen, yet assuming the same father? Or did they assume they were full-blood siblings? I... I know it's like one in the morning while I write this part of the script, but I have so many questions and now this thought is plaguing me. I know I'm thinking about this more than the devs did, but still, did no one consider this? Whatever the case, Sumeragi time. Did I ever mention I hate this chapter in my last challenge run? Because I hate this chapter. And it was here that I hit a roadblock. The enemies were just too powerful for even my best units to survive against, so I had to take a moment to improve my army. I chose to grind everyone except for us to the level cap, without the use of eternal seals, and bought a bunch of offensive staves. The problem was I was sticking to my normal strats, which work better when I have a properly balanced out team. So for once in my life, it was time to go on the offensive with staves and fates. Benny would act as a wall to pull in enemies from the center of the map, while Forrest would weaken them from afar. 
This worked perfectly as everyone survived enemy phase, allowing my army to rush the enemy in the central chamber easily. From here, I could use the dragon vein and take my time to plan out how to tackle the rest of the map. It was here I remembered my Mozu strategy back in chapter 23. Obviously that won't work with enclosed lifts, but I could modify it. The plan was to start with the southern part of the map, sending a unit with high resistance to bait the mages and clear a path. I chose Leo for this as he has the highest resistance and made sure to pair Nyx up with him to improve it further. Elise also joined the small group. Now, this is a ridiculously small group to handle all the enemies on the southern part of the map, but that's not the goal. No, I have some restraint traps in mind. Leo can lure enemies over and either kill or weaken them. Elise is there to act as an extra hand depending on how things go. From there, if things seem dangerous, Elise can warp back to safety, and Forrest can use Rescue to save Leo from danger. After my first round of this, I realized a road she can also use Rescue due to its low proficiency requirement, meaning I'd be able to rescue two units instead of one. I'd be able to rescue three had I not changed Corn from a Hoshido Noble to a Nor Noble, but doing so had its purpose. With this realization, I was able to send Mozu down with the group to assist with removing the dangerous Kinchi Knight and merchants. Once I cleared a good opening, I had the group wait in the southern portion of the map, being careful not to trigger the southern reinforcements. This allowed me to ferry more units to the southern area in order to assist with removing these reinforcements. Once you pass the wall before the southern dragon vein, some master ninja and an oni chieftain will spawn just by the lift door. Since my current party is more focused on dealing with magic users, I'd need other units to help. In this case, Perry and Niles are useful thanks to their shuriken breaker skill. Luckily, I don't need to worry about anyone once these reinforcements are handled, as all reinforcements on this map are scripted based on your progress and not turn count. So once the southern dragon vein is taken care of, I can regroup in the central chamber and plan out how I'll handle the northern dragon vein. Since the northern area has Master Ninja and Spear Masters, I'd essentially have to do the same strategy, but with units who have high defense instead of resistance. In this case, I want Benny with support from Effie. Mozu and Elise also tag along but like before. It takes a bit to clear out a safe area for my units to move forward, but once it seems safe enough, I have Elise start ferrying units over with her warp skill. The highest priority units are Perry and Niles, once again thanks to their Shuriken Breaker skill. The Master Ninja by the Dragon Vein weren't budging, which worried me, but I managed to bait them by aggroing the Spear Master near them. Doing so allowed me to clear out the area without triggering the reinforcements. Once it was done, I worked on getting my whole army into the northern area of the map. With everyone back together, I finally triggered the northern reinforcements. I made sure to clear them out and the enemies in the corner of the map before using the Dragon Vein. Once the final Dragon Vein is used, the last wave of reinforcements appears. These guys are just a case of being patient and taking them out after they approach you. After that, it was finally time to move for towards Sumeragi. Earlier in the map, I actually had Forrest use the Hexing Rod on the Swordmaster so as to make this portion easier. By baiting the units around Sumeragi, they managed to block the lift door. However, this was fine as I froze Sumeragi in place so I could safely remove his adds. Once they were done with, I had Elise finish the late King of Hoshido off, clearing the chapter with ease. I mean, it took 60 turns and an hour of my life, but the strategy made the map super easy. After taking so long to deal with Sumeragi, Gunter got bored of our antics and decided to take matters into his own hands. Since I don't have Azura this time around, I only have 8 ward tiles available for my party to use. Because of this, I chose to take this battle rather slow as I pushed my way forward. At this point, I had a good feel for my units, and so dealing with the various enemies around here wasn't much of an issue. I did, however, make sure to drop by the chest on the right of Gunter. This has a crescent bow, which is vital to my ability to finish the game. From here, I let Mozu take down Gunter, showing off the power of the crescent bow when put in the right hands. Dive. 
Gunter was unable to handle making such a fool of himself, trying to take his life out of shame. However, I can't let him die here. He has use for me yet. Before moving on to the final battle, I take a moment to do some final weapon forging. Most important of all is forging Mozu's crescent bow to be even more powerful. Once again, I cannot emphasize enough as to how important this is. With the preparations complete, I make my way to the final battle. Up first is the gauntlet to reach Anankos. Despite my team's power, I find it best to pull back and then go forward, while using the dragon mains to prevent reinforcements. While it means the map takes much longer, it's a much safer strategy that allows me some breathing room when I get closer to Anankos. See, Anankos is the reason I got Mozu that crescent bow. Thanks to his dragon skin ability, he greatly reduces the damage units do to him, and the only thing that can ignore the damage reduction is the Yato. However, I can't use the Yato due to my rule set. Sure, the Omega Yato is also called the Fire Emblem, but it's still the Omega Yato. That's where the Crescent Bow comes in. By being able to hit four times in one turn, Mozu can still do massive damage to Anonkos and has a good chance of getting off a crit, which she manages to do here, weakening the dragon enough for Korin to come in and finish him off. This is only the beginning, though, as we must face the dragon's true form. Now, I can start to play fast and loose, as we need to destroy Anankos before his reinforcements exhaust us. Mozu manages to take out Anankos' first two health bars with the help of Obero and Effie. The first phase of Anankos' head does physical attacks, so I set up Benny and Korn to chip away at him. Though, once Niles dies, I begin to realize I'm on a timer here and need to deal with this phase quickly. So, I send in Mozu to take out the third health bar and use my final rescue to take her to safety and heal her. Thankfully, I've kept all my mages alive thus far, as this final phase deals magic damage. This means my mages will have great defense against Sinankos as they chip away at him. And because this is the final phase, I play freely with my units, only having to worry about keeping Korn and Mozu alive. Odin is the next to fall, soon followed by Nyx. But the end is just in sight. Anankos has 21 HP remaining, so Leo attacks with Mozu on backup, giving her the chance to reverse her halved strength. Only one damage is done in this battle, but it works out perfectly. Mozu gets into position, takes aim, and... The game is officially won. Korn gets crowned King of Vala, and then hallucinates Zero one last time. But really, they need to let go. They must understand that the incident was years ago. Azura has been dead since Chapter 7. As the credits roll, we can finally answer the question of whether you can beat Revelation without the letter A. And the answer is... sort of. Chapters 2 through 6 were all impossible with this rule set. However, you have no real control over army customization at that point. If you start the challenge at Chapter 7, it's still a bit of a split on whether or not it, this is possible thanks to the use of seals. So no, it isn't possible if you strictly adhere to a whole absolutely no A rule. But if you play by my rules that made an exception for seals and start the challenge on chapter 7, then yes, this challenge is doable. As for whether I would recommend this challenge, I absolutely would. Maybe not a no A challenge specifically, as I had to do a ton of planning for how to set up and play out this run beforehand, but this is a really fun way to play the game, and you can obviously modify the rules to make it easier or harder. I know I didn't include skills in my rules, but you could include those to make this challenge harder. Or maybe you want to make the rule only apply to classes, or only to characters or something like that in order to make it easier. Of course, you should check what is available to you when you make your rules before playing. 
as I wrap this up, I gotta say, the experience is almost like playing the Fates randomizer. You're given a strange assortment of characters you may never usually use, and are forced to make use of mechanics that you might normally ignore. I mean, I don't normally take advantage of partner or friendship seals, but I did here. Not to mention you get to mess with some fun builds. Hero Benny was one of my favorite parts of this run. I really never expected to gain a soft spot for any weird units I made. Anyways, I plan on continuing my monotype engage run soon, and have another Fates challenge planned. Of course, I'm always up for weird challenge run suggestions. I think I'm all revelationed out for now, though. <laughs> Whatever the case is, I'll see y'all around next time. <laughs>